Let me just share my screen real quick and we'll get cracking. So today we're going to start this uh, section on spectroscopy. Yeah, so we're going to start with uh, start with NMR, and I'll send out <clears throat> a couple of videos after class to supplement what we discussed today and uh, after today and watching the first video, maybe the second video, then you'll be able to take the quiz that's on uh, on Blackboard, the NMR quiz, but I'll open all of it up today. Uh, yeah, so let's start when it gets ready, I guess. Come on, man. All right. So we talked about NMR kind of briefly on Friday, and today we're going to talk about it in more detail. If you Again, if you took me for part one for lab, then you got at, at least a little exposure um, to NMR. But now we're gonna get into more of the nuts and bolts of it. So, um, so this is a NMR spectrum that's on the screen. And basically what NMR is gonna tell us is four things, right? It's gonna tell us number one, <clears throat> how many different types of, and I'll, let, me, let me backtrack. We're talking about, in this case, proton NMR, right? So there's a difference in proton NMR, carbon NMR, boron, fluorine, silicon. Like you, you can look at several different types of nuclei, but for this, we're gonna be talking about proton NMR. Um, so what proton NMR is gonna tell us, number one is how many different types of hydrogens are present in a molecule, right? So that's what we, we mean by uh, non-equivalent. It's hydrogens that are not like each other, right? And so if you look in this NMR spectrum, you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five different signals. And what that means <clears throat> is that you have five different types of hydrogens in this molecule. And we can point them out, even though you may not understand it right at the moment, but these hydrogens are gonna give their own signal. These two here are gonna give a signal, <clears throat> the two, CH3s here and here are going to give separate signals. And then this alkene hydrogen right here is going to give its own signal, right? And so what you'll notice about the spectrum, number one, you got multiple signals. Number two, the signals don't all look alike. It's not just all straight lines and they, they're not all the same height or the same intensity or even uh, the same number of lines. You can see right here that this is two lines. Down here, this is four lines, and these are all one line, right? So all of that matters, and, it's, and we can explain it all based on the uh, theory behind NMR, right? So what you'll also learn from NMR, from the spectrum, is the environment, the chemical environment of each hydrogen, right? If it's upfield or downfield. Upfield is, um, let me move that out of the way. Upfield is, going towards zero, downfield is going away from zero. And uh, an upfield shift can be something as small as 0.1 parts per million, right? Because the X axis right here is, is uh, the chemical shift is measured in part, parts per million. So 0 0.1, 0 0.01 upfield is a shift, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be a drastic shift to be upfield or, or downfield shift, but for the most part, downfield uh, protons, are electron poor and the upfield protons are electron rich. And what you'll also notice is that all of these protons are in different places, right? These are somewhere between two and two and a half. These are between three and a half and about four. And then this is down here uh, at about six and a half. So that matters too. And we'll, we'll discuss all of that. Like why, they, why do the protons show up where they show up? Why you know, do they split into two lines or three lines or four lines or they don't split at all? Uh, all of that we're gonna learn. And then how many of each type of hydrogen is present, we'll learn that as well. That's a term called integration, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then the uh, neighboring hydrogens, what's next door to each hydrogen, right? That That's where your splitting pattern comes in. Your, doublets and triplets and quartets and, and so on and so forth, but we're gonna talk about that too. <laughs> so 
looking at this spectrum, right? Even if we look here at this signal, this signal right here corresponds to this hydrogen. What you'll notice is that that hydrogen is on an alkene, it's on a double bond. And one, one of the things that you'll notice within a Mars is that there are trends that you can kind of predict where a proton is going to show up. You can use those trends to predict where a proton is going to show up, right? So alkene protons, and, and, and we're going to, I have a chart for this, so don't worry about it if you're not trying to write notes and things like that. I do have a chart for it, but I'm just talking about it because it's, it's here, right? So alkene protons like these always show up somewhere between about uh, six and seven, right? And then if you look at uh, the methyl groups here, right? These methyl groups are showing up here. One of them is a doublet. That's going to be this one right here. And we'll talk about that. And the other one is a singlet. And then you have two more protons. You got a set of protons here and then here. The, those are going to be those are going to show up here because of the chemical environment of those protons. So all of this we'll talk about in detail. We're going to talk about each topic separately. So non equivalence, the environment, uh, the integration, and the splitting pattern. We're going to talk about all of that uh, separately. Right. So NMR is an acronym for <laughs> excuse me, nuclear magnetic resonance. And what NMR uses is the magnetic field that already exists uh, around the nucleus of a proton. We're talking about proton NMR, so hydrogen, hydrogen NMR. So the hydrogen nucleus has its own magnetic field. So that's what NMR uses to generate a signal. I'm going to talk about like the theory behind it as well. Um, what NMR tells us is about the carbon hydrogen framework of a molecule. In other words, how the carbons and hydrogens in a molecule are connected. Um, then it's intensity versus chemical shift. Chemical shift is zero to 10. You can see that right here, even though this spectrum only goes to seven. Normally, uh, the, the uh, NMR spectra starts at zero. And sometimes you can get signals that show up past 10, like carboxylic acid signals. Uh, sometimes aldehyde signals will move a little bit past 10, but for the most part, uh, the, the spectrum is from zero to 10. Um, and then the data in an in NMR spectrum is uh, expressed relative to what we call uh, the, the compound tetramethylsilane, right, TMS. And TMS always is... Uh, the signal for TMS shows up at zero, right? And so everything in the NMR can be calibrated based on the signal for TMS. All right, so you've seen this if you've taken uh, Organic One Lab and you came on the day where we did the aspirin NMR, you've seen an NMR instrument before. It's, it's basically a giant magnet in a can, <laughs> for lack of a better description. Uh, there's a superconducting magnet and it's insulated within this um, uh, case or canister. And within there, the, the case, there is liquid nitrogen and liquid helium to keep the magnet cold, right? You, that's one of the uh, biggest uh, threats to an NMR spectrometer is if, you, uh, if it quenches, right? The magnet can quench if the temperature gets past a certain point. So you have to keep this um, super cold. So liquid helium, liquid nitrogen, um, and that maintains the, the magnet to generate your external magnetic field, right? So you take a sample, you dissolve it up in an NMR tube, which you've seen before, uh, put the tube in the magnet, lower it uh, using compressed air, and then you bombard that signal or that uh, sample with radio frequency energy. All right, so you just pulse it and pulse it and pulse it um, until you get a certain number of scans. Normally for a proton, NMR is 16 scans, but you can always do more. And normally uh, if you have a more dilute sample, you need to do more scans in order to get a good high resolution uh, spectrum. But 
if you have a really concentrated sample, you don't really have to do as many scans, but 16 is the norm for a proton NMR. All right, so the theory behind this, because normally NMR really is a black box for a lot of people. Uh, you just go, you take your NMR, you get your results and you leave. But it's good to understand it because that helps to, it helps when it's time to uh, take a spectra and deconstruct it and use that spectra to like determine what the structure of your molecule is or so on and so forth. So um, every hydrogen nucleus, we, again, we're talking about proton NMR. Every hydrogen nucleus is gonna have its own magnetic field that precesses and it's, ra it's random, right? The way it spins. Um, but if you expose it to an external magnetic field, like the magnet that's in the NMR, the spins, because there, it's a magnetic field, and because the, the uh, nuclei are precessing randomly, those spins are going to line up with the external field. They're either going to line up with it or against it, right? So the way this works over here, these are your randomly ordered spins. And then this is the NMR magnet. So this is the applied magnetic field. And then here is where the spins actually, so when you drop your sample down into that magnet, uh, the spins of the, of the sample are either going to line up with the field or they're going to line up against the field, like so, right? So these are going with the field. You can see these going in the same direction and these against the field. And so what you have to do <clears throat> is add some energy, some external energy to get the ones that are lined up against the field to line up with the field. So you pulse this with radio frequency energy and the spins that were out of line, then they come into line. Right. And that's what you call resonance when all the spins are lined up in the same direction. But between pulses, the spins relax back. Right. So every time you pulse, they line up. But in between the pulses, they relax back. So when they relax back, energy is given off. And that's what gets picked up by your detector. And you record that as what's called a free induction decay, which is this weird looking graph right here. And if you notice, this is in time, not parts per million, right? And so there's some other mathematical uh, manipulation that has to happen to turn this into a readable spectrum. So what you what you do, not you personally, but you know the NMR processing software, is you uh, do what's called a Fourier transform. It's just a command that you tell the NMR or tell the uh, the detector, you just type in FT, depending on what software you're using. Um, you type in FT, which is short for Fourier transform, and it'll convert your FID into a readable spectrum with a with a um, scale on the, on the x-axis in parts per million. All right, so that's how you generate the spec. That's the theory behind it. Um, we're going to look at a couple of reactions. All right, yeah. Let's look at a couple of reactions. So we take uh, this alkene and we add HBr to it. Right, we have a, this is the formula C16H34Br. Uh, and this is the molecular weight. And then this is the mass spec, which we'll talk about later. <laughs> and then this is the infrared. Right, but we're going to look at the NMR of this sample, right? So this is my sample. You see uh, there are multiple types of, uh, I think the molecular formula is off. So I'll fix that. I think that's a typo. Uh, this is not 16 carbons, but I will, we'll, I'll fix that part. But the point is that we, when we do this reaction, this is the product and we need to find out if we have what we say we have, because that's what NMR does. If, if you're in a, in a lab and you're doing a synthesis, and you have to prove it, right? You can't just go in and dump some chemicals into a flask and then, you know, come out and say, hey, I made such and such. Uh, you actually have to prove that you made what you made and the best way to prove it is to do an NMR because that's gonna tell you, you do a proton NMR, uh, that's gonna tell you how the carbons are connected and how the hydrogens are oriented uh, with respect to each other. All right, so the first question is, where do the signals come from? So if you notice, right, when we talk about non-equivalence, every hydrogen in here that's different 
is what we call non-equivalent, right? They're not the same. And so if you look at the, this is all color coded, right? So the orange, as well close to orange as I could get, those pr protons are here. Notice that both of them, because these two are equivalent to each other, but they're not equivalent to anything else in the molecule. So these two are gonna give this signal. And then the black that's here, those three protons all represented by the same signal because they're all equivalent to each other. And then the red protons are here. You notice that's, that peak is higher in intensity than all of your other peaks. And what that means is that both sets of protons, right, are represented by this one signal because these two are equivalent to each other, right? So that's six protons and not three. That's why the signal is so much bigger than the rest of them. And then you have the purple or pink protons here, right? The teal colored protons here, and then the blue colored protons here, right? So all of these signals, one, two, three, four, five, six signals. If you see six signals in the NMR, what that means is that you have six different types of protons or six, what I like to call sets of non-equivalent protons, right? And the way you test for equivalence is simple. You can take, uh, you can take a, uh, take a compound when you make, let's say we want to compare these two, right? What you do is you take one off here, one proton off here and replace it with some other atom. And then you take, or you can take one proton from here and replace that with another atom and compare the two isomers, right? If they are the same, then the protons are equivalent. If they're different, then the protons are non-equivalent. So if you something is equivalent, we call those homotopic, right? So all three of these protons on this carbon will be the same. So these are homotopic. But when you compare the CH3 here and the CH2 here, those are not the same based on the test, right? The two different protons because you're going to get two different compounds if you replace one of the protons with another atom. So these are what we call heterotopic, right? So if you go back here, everything here is heterotopic. And then on, if the protons are on the same carbon, like the two blue ones, they are what we call homotopic. But nothing here is equivalent, right? You can take a chlorine and put a chlorine here, 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 or here, and you're going to get five, six different compounds, right? And the same if you take these two and compare them. If you put a chlorine here or here, you're going to get the same compound, right? Any questions about the equivalence? Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm just a little confused when it comes to, you said something about the blue hydrogens being different from- Everything their, else. Yeah, so the blue hydrogens are homotopic because, why are they homotopic? Because they're on the same carbon. And why wouldn't the, like, the pink or the light blue or the orange ones be homotopic? They are, with each oh, other. They Oh, okay, got it, got it. Got it. Yeah, they're, if they're on the same carbon and there's no nothing there to distinguish them, like there's not a stereo center close by, something like that, mm -hmm. then they're going to be homotopic. Okay, got it. Thank but you. compared to each other, they're heterotopic. Okay. Good question. All right, so we know now we, we can test for equivalence, and I'll, I'll come out of this and put uh, an example on the screen. Uh, with my iPad uh, to kind of illustrate that a little bit further. But I want to talk about um, a second topic because we know now about non-equivalence and now we need to know about chemical shift, like why certain protons show up where they show up. Uh, and so the reason why the signals show up in certain places is because of the chemical environment. If it's in an electron rich environment, it's going to show up more upfield. Right, and again, when I say more upfield, it doesn't mean that it's gonna go from four all the way down to two, right? It might go from four to uh, 3.7 or 3.8. So upfield shift, is, it doesn't have to be a drastic shift for it to be considered an upfield or a downfield shift, right? If it, go, if it moves from four to 4.1, that's considered a downfield shift. Uh, so 
again, this is measured in parts per million and every proton has a specific chemical shift somewhere between zero and 10. Uh, if you have a downfield signal, a lot of times that's gonna be attached to uh, an SP2 hybridized atom, or it's gonna be in the, in the proximity with a highly electronegative atom, right? Anytime a, a, a signal gets shifted downfield, it's called deshielding, right? That's an that's a, a observation that we call deshielding, right? So the proton, the um, electron density around the proton is lessened and the, sh the chemical shift moves downfield, right? So let's, let's talk about that. So again, we see these are our protons, they're color-coded, <clears throat> and we see all of them at different locations, right? So we see them at all of them at different locations, right? The black protons are showing up at 3.3, the orange at 3.37. Again, not a big downfield shift, but it's a downfield shift. It's uh, 0 0.07 parts per million further downfield than this one, right? And then over here on the red protons, you can see showing up at 1.84. Uh, and then the pink, 1.71. 1.51 and then 1.29. And what you'll notice is for the, the protons here and kind of in the middle of the chain, it's like the further they get away from the electronegative atoms because bromine is electronegative, so is oxygen. Uh, but oxygen is, is even more electronegative. The further they get away from those atoms, the more upfield they get shifted, right? So all of these protons show up in different places because of where they are relative to the electronegative atoms in, the, in that molecule, right? So you can see these showing up at 1.84. If that bromine wasn't there, these protons would probably be all the way down here close to one because uh, most, most of your alkyl protons show up somewhere between zero and one and a half. So you can see everything here has got a little bit of a downfield shift. Um, because of the bromine here and oxygen here, right? So based on this chart, you can see from, this is basically zero to two, your alkyl protons, right? Simple alkyl protons with, without any functional groups around them, they're gonna show up really closer to one, but you can say zero from zero to two. Um, they, that's gonna be all mostly upfield. And then notice the proton here is bound to a carbon that's adjacent to a sp2 carbon, like a carbonyl or a double bond or aromatic ring or something like that, right? So those uh, alpha, we call them either alpha protons or they can be allylic or benzylic, those are gonna show up between two and three, all right? We're gonna, and we're gonna do examples with this, so don't panic. Uh, if it's not clicking immediately, we're going to do a lot of examples with this. Um, and then if it's immediate, if the carbon where the hydrogen is, is immediately bound to a heteroatom like oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, like that, notice the shift is somewhere between three and five. That's a big difference than just being next to an sp2 carbon or just being an alkyl carbon, right? So somewhere between three and five, those protons show up, right? And then the further you go down the spectrum, it's gonna, that's gonna be dependent upon what type of environment that proton is in. So here, the hydrogen is directly attached to a, to a, a double bond. That's what we call a vanillic hydrogen because of the, out, the double bond is also known as a vinyl group. So the vanillic protons between four and a half and six and a half. Uh, and then aromatic protons between six and a half and eight. Aldehyde protons show up between nine and 10. And then the uh, carboxylic acid protons show up somewhere a little bit past 10, sometimes between 10 and 12, All right? So that's probably the furthest out that you'll see a, a proton show up for a proton NMR, All right? And again, if you look at these protons, you can kind of gauge why certain protons are further downfield than others. You can see here, this is 
on this carbon where these hydrogens are, that's directly attached to oxygen, right? And if we look at the chart, we see that those should show up somewhere between three and five. And you see that here. So this is 3.3 for the black. And then this is 3.37, right, for these orange protons right here that are connected to directly on a carbon that's directly bound to oxygen. Uh, and then here, these are at 1.84. They're the furthest downfield uh, of the alkyl protons that are close to bromine, right? And that's, the reason is because the protons are in the vicinity of that bromine. So they're gonna get deshielded and pushed downfield uh, further away than they would be, or further downfield than they would be if there was no bromine there. All right, uh, questions about the shift, the chemical shift. All right. So again, this is this chart right here. I don't think it's in the handout, but I can I can make this chart available to you as well. And it's in the book. If you look in the syllabus, the, the section dealing with NMR is in the syllabus and the chart is in that section too. So, but I can make it available to you. <clears throat> so the, the other topic is the splitting, right? Because if you notice on the NMR spectrum, like, the only two of these are single lines, right? This is a this is split into three lines. This is split into three lines. This is split into five lines, and this is uh, also split into five lines. So there's a reason for that, right? And what the basic reason is because of what we call the n plus one rule. So the n plus one rule states that um, if a set of protons is adjacent, uh, two sets of protons are adjacent, they're gonna experience each other's magnetic fields. And depending on how many protons are adjacent, right, that's gonna determine how many lines that a signal is split into, right? So we use the N plus one rule. And that's really a basic, uh, basic rule, right? N plus one, so we got, and I always say, like to say that N, is the number of neighbors. And I'll show you why I say that when we look back at the, at the spectrum, right? So it's the number of protons on the adjacent carbon plus one. That's what EN plus one, the EN plus one rule is. And that's how you know how many lines your signal is gonna be split into. So let's talk about, uh, we'll talk about that when we wanna pull that slide up, but you have a set of peaks uh, that split into more than one line. Right, if it's split into two lines, we call it a doublet. Three lines, we call it a triplet. Four lines, we call it a quartet. Five lines, a pentet. Six lines, sextet, so on and so forth. Normally, when you get past eight lines, because there, there are some signals that can be split into eight lines, you just call it a multiplet. Unless it's a complex splitting pa pattern, and then we're gonna talk about that also, but if it's a complex splitting pattern, then you, you have to use some different type of nomenclature to describe that, uh, that signal, all right? So let's look at it. So you can see right here, uh, the orange protons are here and it's split into a triplet, it's three lines. And then the black protons are a singlet. So let's see if we can figure that out. So the orange protons, if we look to the left on oxygen, there are no protons on oxygen. Right? So for, for that, N will equal zero. But to the right, that two pro, the two blue protons are adjacent to these. So for this, six, for this set of protons, N equals two, right? It has two neighbors. So if N equals two, N plus one is gonna be three and that's gonna be a triplet. Let me go back, right? So this is gonna be a triplet. And we're gonna, we're gonna work through this. So I know it's all verbal now, but we're gonna work through it too, because we gotta, I put the handout in the chat, by the way, for those of you who came in after I did it. So you can just grab that from the chat. And then for the black protons, the, this, the protons on this carbon, there are no neighbors here, right? So N is zero, so that line is going to be a singlet. All right, let me, let me see if I can. 
space is a singlet. N equals zero, so N plus one, one. And down here, N equals two, so N plus one will be three, and that's a triplet. All right, questions about that? Any questions about that? All right, so that's a singlet again, and the other is a triplet because of the neighboring proton lines. All right, let's go down the spectrum. And you can see right here, the red set of protons is, is also a singlet, right? And so why, why do you think that's a singlet? Let, and let's just look at one of them because they're both equivalent. We don't have to look at both, but let's just look at one. What is N for this set of protons? Is N zero because there's nothing adjacent to it? Right. So N is zero N plus one is going to be one. Why would you not count the hydrogens on the other CH3? Too far away. Okay. The neighbor has to be right next door. So if this is the this this is the proton you're looking at, that must be a proton on this carbon. Oh, okay, makes sense. Yeah, Thanks. it's got to it's got to be adjacent. If it's not adjacent, immediately adjacent, then you can't count it. You do see sometimes in rare instances you'll see what's called long range coupling, where a proton can couple with an, another set of protons that's you know further away from it, but it, it's really rare to see that. All right, let's look at um, the pink set. What what splitting pattern is this? Triplet. It's a triplet, right? The reason it's a triplet is because if you look to the right, there are no hydrogens on this carbon. If you look to the left, there are two hydrogens on this carbon, right? So for that set of protons, N is two. And then N plus one is going to be three. So it's a triplet. Y'all following? Any Anybody not see that? Like why it's a triplet, or why why am I saying, or why am I, why I'm saying n is two? Um, could you explain why n is two again? It's not because there's two hydrogens sharing on one carbon. No, it's it's because those two hydrogens, when they look to the left, they're gonna see two hydrogens next door to them. Okay. Yeah. So n is the number of neighbors. Got it. All right. Good question. Right, and, they, and, and that's another uh, question, another point. If they're homotopic, they're not gonna split with each other, right? So these two protons are not gonna split with each other. Now, if you have protons that are non-equivalent on the same carbon, then they will split with one another. And there are some examples of that that we're gonna look at later, not right now, but they will split with each other if they are heterotopic on the same carbon. But that's a, that's a case where, Sometimes you'll have like a, a chiral center close by or, or adjacent, then that changes the chemical environment. It makes them die stereotopic and then they'll split with each other. But we're, we're gonna talk about that later. All right, what about the teal colored ones? Let's see here. How many neighbors would these have? Four. Four, good. And so in plus one is five. That's a pentet. So I can change the color of that. I don't know if I can. Oh, yes, I can. There's no teal up here. I'll do that. That's close enough. <laughs> All right. And then for the blue, what do you think? Four. And it's four again. So you can see that signal is one, two, three, four, five lines. It's a pentet. It's a pentet also. Um, and so that's gonna be five lines. All right. 
questions about the about the split splitting parents. All right. Let me clear this off. All right, so this is just a an, an explanation of splitting patterns again. So we, we already talked about that. So uh, and then here here are the rules for spin splitting, right? So if everything is equivalent, like here you got symmetry between these two carbons. If everything is equivalent, then they're not going to split, right? That'll just be a big singlet that's worth four protons. Here, these are all homotopic. They're not going to split. Right here, these are different, right? I know the example makes it looks like makes it look like they are equivalent, but they're not. So the, let's just say for the sake of the example that they're not the same. So here, they're right next door to each other. They're gonna split. They're gonna experience each other's magnetic field and they're gonna split with one another. Um, here, because they are, there's a carbon interrupting the coupling between them, they're not gonna split, right? This would, if they did split, this would be an example of what we call long range coupling. But you, again, that's a rare, very rare observation. Um, so let's talk about the integration now. And integration is talking about uh, how many protons each signal represents, right? So each set of non equivalent protons is going to give its own signal. And then the intensity is gonna be based on how many protons that signal uh, represents, right? So we go back to here. You can see right here for the orange, that signal, it, if you integrate it, it is, it, it'll integrate for two protons, all right? And let me show you real quick if I can annotate this. All right, the integration, is normally a curve. It looks something, oh no, not like that. Let me fix that, that was crappy. The integration is a curve that looks something like this, right? If you had calculus or uh, Cal 1 or 2 or DE, it's, it, when you hear integral, that's exactly what it is. It, you have a curve, and then you take the area under the curve and that area is gonna determine how many protons that signal represents. So uh, normally, well, well, before the software did it, you had to do it by hand. So you had to measure everything with a ruler. You'll have something to calibrate by. And then based on the calibrated, the, uh, the calibrated number, you can determine the number of, of protons each signal represents, right? But this uh, signal is gonna integrate for two. The black signal is going to integrate for three. The big signal, the red signal here, both since both these sets are the same, the equivalent is going to integrate for six. And then this is uh, the pink will be two. Everything else is going to be two, right? So you have uh, the number of signals, which we talked about based on all the non equivalent protons. You have the chemical shift, which is the location of each signal, right? You have the splitting pattern, which is how many lines each signal is gonna be split into, and you have integration. Those four things, if you know those, and you can, you, you know um, where certain protons are supposed to show up, you can actually solve uh, a spectrum. You can take a molecular formula without the structure, look at the spectrum, and figure out how it's put together. And, you know, people do that all the time. Sometimes uh, you'll have an NMR and you'll have a compound and you got to match it up. But sometimes you might have the formula and no compound, no structure, but you have an NMR. And based on how the NMR looks and where the signals are, you can kind of determine 
uh, what that structure is. So it gives us an idea. That's why we go back to the carbon hydrogen framework uh, because it gives us an idea about that. All right. So we're going to actually, my 50 already. We're going to actually stop here. Um, let me stop recording.